Congratulations to Sans for winning that competition that was on Tumblr. It just goes to show, women prefer a sense of humor and godlike powers over looks any day. Hello again people, in this video I'm going to be talking about 2D JRPG games, and more importantly, how our brains react to these games and make us feel like these pixelated characters are real life people. The term JRPG is very vague because before it was a reference to RPG video games that were specifically developed in Japan, like Dragon Quest or Earthbound. However, this style of video game has bled into the western gaming sphere in recent years, more so than ever, as the children who played these games before have now become game developers themselves, and with intuitive tools like RPG Maker MV and MZ, making a video game in this style has never been easier to do. This video is going to be covering multiple games that fall into the category of 2D JRPG style. These games typically involve pixelated, low detail graphics, a heavy emphasis on story, and are almost always portrayed in a top-down format. Why is this style of game so popular with people? How is it that these pixelated characters can invoke a reaction strong or even stronger than the photorealistic 4K characters in AAA video games? After careful consideration I have come to a conclusion that involves our brains, and how sometimes they play tricks on us. But first, let's establish a baseline of understanding. First we'll have a quick overview of pixel art as a genre. All the games we will talk about today involve pixel art style graphics. If you would like a much larger overview of pixel art, Sawtunes has made an amazing in-depth video explaining pixel art, link in the description. Pixel art is an art style typically made with computer graphics software that features, well, pixels. Defined as the smallest element within a two-dimensional picture divided into a matrix of squares. Singular squares of color all being compiled together to make an image. Keep that in mind going forward. Pixel art graphics are distinguished by the overall matrix of squares, 32x32, 48x48, 64, and 128 are the most common measurements of pixel art graphics. The difference between these measurements is the number of pixels and with more pixels you have more detail. Look at this image in 32 by 32. It's an apple. But let's see how it changes when we add more pixels. This is 48 pixels, now we can clearly see where the light source is coming from. 64, then 128. Now we can clearly see the curvature of the apple and the details on the leaf. The more pixels there are within an image, the clearer the image becomes. Back in the early 1980s, computer-generated graphics were new and quite limited by the processing power at the time. Computers back then could only simulate graphics of this quality. Today, we have graphics cards that are capable of 4K and even 8K graphics, so why do we still enjoy games that seemingly limit themselves? Well, speaking from experience, 3D modeling is a challenging task if the goal is to emulate real life. Also, when making video games within a 3D environment, gravity, sound, and light simulation are all things that would have to be taken into consideration. 2D games are just easier for smaller development teams to make, especially with the tools mentioned earlier. This convenience has been made at the cost of graphical quality. We know that some gamers aren't as focused on graphical quality as others, but that still doesn't explain why games like Undertale can take the internet by storm and make such an impact that it did. After looking over games in this style that came before and after Undertale, I have come to the conclusion that the solution to this quandary is the story. The story is what people always gravitate to when they remember games like Undertale. Quick, tell me what Papyrus' main goal was. What did the character Papyrus want the most? If you said it was to be a part of the Royal Guard, you'd be correct. Now tell me what the first defensive item is that you can buy from the Purple Bunny in the shop in Snowden. Now I'm sure the super attentive Mega Undertale fans would be able to remember that it was the Manly Bandana but I would also bet that the majority of you actually didn't know. My point is that your brain deemed the papyrus information more important, so it was more likely to be remembered, even though the bandana information was more beneficial, as the bandana gives you more defense and helps you during the papyrus boss fight. I personally remember specifically that papyrus wanted to join the royal guard because he wanted to have friends, and I also remember that Undyne knew that papyrus was harmless so she decided to teach him cooking instead under the guise that it was training. I remember this clearly and I have only played Undertale all the way through a grand total of three times in my entire life. 
Yes, this could be attributed to Toby Fox's storytelling, but I would argue it goes beyond just him. And like I said, it's the story that people mostly remember. Let's talk about stories and how they shaped our species as a whole. In a short scholarly journal titled Stories, Their Powerful Role in Early Language and Literacy, published by the National Association for the Education of Young Children, the article read, Through stories, we organize, put a voice to our life experiences, and then we pass on our wisdom, history, and culture from one generation to the next. Remember in the stealth video where we talked about early human development and how the most efficient hunters who understood stealth were able to pass down the best techniques to their children? This is how they did it, through stories. Got another story? One more. There was a horse. The horse sought vengeance upon his enemy, a stag. But he could not kill the stag alone. The horse met a man, a hunter, and made a deal. He took the man's bit and bridle and allowed him to ride in a saddle on his back. Together, they killed the stag and the horse tasted victory. But the hunter would not release the horse and made a slave of him. So getting revenge cost him his freedom. Hope it was worth it. It was not. Parents, mentors, and just people trying to keep each other company during the quiet and dark nights in ancient human history. The birthplace of storytelling wasn't in a theater or a writer's room, but a campfire. The stories these pixelated characters go through are what we remember the most. These types of games all have a heavy focus on story. They each take part in making the story unique, either through metaphor wall breaks or gut-wrenching storytelling. I think it's worth it to highlight these stories for their strengths. We'll start off with Everhood, because honestly, this story seems the most insane. No offense if this is going to be your favorite out of the four, but come on. There's literally universal destruction, immortal beings, and magic mushrooms in this story. Things get pretty crazy. I'm not going to spoil the whole plot, as I think Everhood is best experienced for yourself. Links to all these games will be in the description, by the way. Like I said earlier, this game's story is ludicrous, almost by design. I bet you're probably never going to find a video on YouTube titled Everhood Story Explained, because even the characters within this game sometimes don't even know what the heck is going on. Here's a basic synopsis. You play an old wooden puppet named Red, and your arm has been stolen by the Blue Thief. You have to get it back from the Gold King. After taking your arm, the Gold King also takes the legs of the Blue Thief, so now you have to work together to get your stuff back. After obtaining back your arm, you now gain the ability to fight back. Also, I forgot to mention, this world you live in is filled with immortal beings who have lived there for approximately 3,113,370 years, give or take. And they are all coming to grips with their immortality, as some think the world needs to die, and some don't. You spend time with these people, immortal beings, racing go-karts, playing tennis, and even playing through a mythical adventure to defeat a wizard. This quest actually introduces the fight back mechanic before you even get your arm back, which is kind of weird. Also, periodically, there's this frog who thinks that the universe needs to die, which is also kind of weird because he's a clear reference to Kermit the Frog with that banjo. This game actually has six different endings. Because of the sheer scale of this game, and what it tries to accomplish, is what makes it so memorable. I wasn't kidding about the magic mushrooms either. You go on some trips when you play this game. Also, like all these games, the soundtrack is godlike. Everhood may be a crazy story, but the story still has a point to make. That point is, immortality is worthless. Most people would actually jump at the idea of living forever, but it's not until you see what eternity really looks like do you realize that it's not worth it. Death gives life meaning. Okay, so for Amori, I'm going to have to put a disclaimer before I talk about this, because Holy crap, does this game cover some subject matter. Amori is a psychological horror game that entails very rough and gory imagery. From committing Sudoku to living secluded from reality, Amori is a game that I truly enjoyed and it's a game that I would say is fantastic, but also, it's a game that I probably wouldn't recommend to the faint of heart. This game made me so sad that I had to stop halfway through it and take a two day break from it. That's how depressing it was. You play as this person called Omori. Omori is idolized by their friends, and they go on adventures with their friends all the time in this magical dream-like world called Headspace. The story of Omori centers around nostalgia, and the positive and negative emotions one can feel from reminiscing. Throughout the game, many times you take a look inside the scrapbook full of pictures that your best friend Basil has taken of you and your friends. Basil loves to take pictures of people when they aren't expecting it. No, not like that, get your head out of the gutter. Basil understands that memories are precious, 
It's not about the event, it's about the moment. Basil always tries to capture the exact moment where people are living and enjoying each other's company. This scrapbook acts as a storyteller within Omori, which allows you to see the growth and memories this group of friends have together. Omori the character is stone-faced, passive, and they rarely utter a single word. Amori's story is so powerful because of the lessons it teaches about closure. Amori is about accountability, taking responsibility for your actions and moving on in your life. Growing apart from your friends is never easy and darn near painful at some times. I haven't seen my friends in so long, I'm not sure if they even remember me that much. The scrapbook in the story of Amori is supposed to symbolize that even though Amori and their friends have grown so far apart, the memories and the feelings that they felt are still there. Like I said, Amori's true ending is about taking responsibility for your actions and accepting consequences. The lesson it teaches is a warning to those who do not pass on their knowledge to their children. We actually see many failings of parental figures within Amori, as their parents are either shown to be neglectful or rejecting of them. Learn from your mistakes, get out of your own headspace so you can make more memories with your friends in the future. And now we get to Undertale, the game that seemingly started it all, even though it's actually not the oldest game we're going to be covering today. Undertale, while not being the first game to be inspired by early JRPGs in the early 80s and 90s, it was lucky enough to capture so many eyes to the point where it hit mainstream. The gameplay concept of this game is not its only selling point, as it features a labor of love in its soundtrack. Toby Fox, the game's creator and mastermind, had many years of prior experience working on music for Homestuck a webcomic released in the early 2010s. Undertale reached out to so many people that even if you didn't play it or watch a YouTuber play it, there's a good chance that you would have heard about it regardless. The characters of Undertale are what drives the story to be memorable. Yes, there are plot holes in which the game seems to be well aware of. Yeah, why didn't Asgore just take one soul across the barrier and then take six more? Nevertheless, the characters tie the story together with their hopes and dreams. Freedom is desired by every free-thinking person, freedom to live as they are, freedom to go where they please, but freedom can also be interpreted as something symbolic. Much like the monsters of the underground are trapped by the magical barrier, they also remain trapped within their ignorance of humans. The wrongdoings of a group of humans were used to scapegoat all of humanity into being these mindless killers. Offenses of the past can create a systematic hatred which then becomes passed down to the next generation. Undertale is a story about how newer generations need to learn from the mistakes of the past generations if they plan on moving forward. The interactions between Monster Kid and the player are a perfect example of this. Monster Kid at first mistakes you for being another monster and they spend time with you. They share stories of their past and it's clear that MK idolizes Undyne as a hero. Later, when Undyne finds you and upon realizing that you are human, Monster Kid laments at the idea of having to fight you because of the time you spent together. MK is still young and hasn't been conditioned to hate humans as Undyne has. Your esprit de corps, or devotion to their safety, is what makes them realize that Undyne is not the big hero that he thought she was. My first time playing Undertale, I thought it was so cool that if you saved him, he would turn to Undyne and berate her for attacking you. So many people reference their time with Sans and Toriel as their favorite, and those moments are great. But I think these scenes with Monster Kid are the strongest as they tie the theme of overcoming hatred so much more impactfully. Hatred may be strong, but companionship is stronger, and as long as people can gain perspective from stories, they can always find kindness in strangers, no matter how strange they may look. Allegory is a strong form of storytelling that can incite positive change, but it's always important to understand the lessons of stories, rather than just rallying behind the property itself. I mention this because as someone who was around to see the release of Undertale, and more importantly someone who witnessed the actions of the fanbase from the outside, it sucks to say that that did happen with some people. I wouldn't be covering my bases with Undertale if I didn't tackle the controversy surrounding it upon its release. Whenever something becomes incredibly popular in a short amount of time, it's going to attract attention from all sorts of people. There were many instances in the days of its infancy where Undertale fans lashed out at some creators big and small, for things they said, or the way in which they chose to play Undertale for the first time. Unfortunately, these reactions caused some people, like me, to be turned off of Undertale upon its initial release. Personally, I didn't play Undertale all the way through until March of 2018. I think I'll highlight Markiplier's experience with Undertale for two reasons. 
One, I was there watching Mark's uploads and I saw the reactions from people firsthand. And two, it gives me an excuse to use this funny Markiplier meme. At the release of Markiplier's first Undertale video in November of 2015, he already mentions in the first episode that a large portion of fans were not only asking Mark to play the game, but also that he had to play the game purely pacifist and no way else. Welcome to Undertale. Now this is rapidly becoming one of the most popular games in recent years. And you guys out there who tell me that I have to play it and I have to play it a very specific way is because of the effect your choices have on the world around you. Markiplier's first episode seemed to have been received well. Episode two rolls around. Markiplier makes a certain decision in regards to Sans. What did he do? Well, he gave Sans a southern accent, of course. Long story short, certain Undertale fans had quite a lot to say about Mark's creative decisions. And of course, there were Undertale fans, as well as his own fans, that did defend him. Nowadays, the comment section of that video features many comments that actually just talk about the event, rather than comments from the event itself. But nevertheless, the effects can still be seen. Markiplier did not make a part three to his Undertale playthrough. It would not be until October of 2016 almost a year later, when Markiplier would reattempt a playthrough in livestream format with his close friend Tyler. The highlight and silver lining of the story is that eventually Mark did finish the game and he enjoyed it in the end. Stories like Undertale are important to be understood on a critical level, lest you forget the message the story is trying to convey. Undertale is about overcoming differences, rejecting hatred for people who are different or who act in a different way. I don't know what Toby's reaction to this specific event was, but if I was him, this behavior would have made me very upset. The fact that so many people who claim to love my property and also miss the point entirely would really put my confidence as a storyteller into question. It's not Undertale's fault, really. When you get so popular so quick, you draw in all sorts of people, good and bad. Like I mentioned, the entire community wasn't to blame for the controversies. Like all communities, it's typically the loud minority that makes it look bad. I can't wait to see what Toby has in store for the rest of Deltarune. If you're watching this, then there's a good chance my part 1 playthrough of Deltarune demo is out now. I hope you enjoy it. Also, I'll be releasing part 2 soon after this video releases. So if you want to see it, you know what to do. Ah, and now we get to One Shot, my biased favorite game out of these four, and also the oldest one. Yes, that's right, the original release of One Shot was in 2014, making it technically older than Undertale. That is, if we're counting when the game was actually released, however. Now, with One Shot being my favorite out of the set, I could talk about this game for hours on end, but for the sake of video, I'll refrain from dragging on for too long. I'm going to spend the majority of this section talking about how the story of One Shot goes to great lengths to make the story immersive and impactful. The developers of One Shot wanted to adapt the idea of a game where you can only complete it once. Your first experience is the only experience you will ever have with the game and its characters. While that may be an interesting concept, that's not good for replay value, nor is it really practical in a modern video game world. You, the player, input your name and become part of the story as well. Putting your name into the game and pretending to be the main character has always been a staple of early RPGs, and some like Earthbound allow you to choose the name of your party members as well. One Shot takes it a step further in such that you don't have to pretend. Characters in this game regard you by name and some even acknowledge that you are a regular person accessing this simulation on your computer. Pay attention to the wording. Simulation, not game. The tone of the story is maintained by the writers to make sure you still take your actions seriously. If the characters within the game just regarded it as such, then that would imply that there's no cause for concern, but there is. In the simulation, there are people who live who used to have lives until the sun in this world disappeared, and more importantly, Nico is here. Nico, otherwise known as Best Cat Person, is just a child, but by a series of unfortunate events, they are brought here and then told that they are the foretold savior who must return the sun. The two greatest qualities of the story of One Shot is the portrayal of hope and sacrifice. The people in this world live in a state of disarray, but instead of living in despair and bitterness, they continue to care for each other like tomorrow was guaranteed. I think the people in the real world can learn something from people in the one-shot universe. Ambiguous characters like the author, whom we never actually meet, has maintained this name, for they are the only person in the world who has continued to write stories and give them to other people to publish. 
The author understands the importance of books and literature, and how even though we might not live long enough to see the information be passed down, we should continue to work as if it was. It's not blind hope that drives the author to continue to do what they do, it's an understanding and an effort to improve the situation incrementally despite the situation looking dire. It is so much more convincing when characters have a constructive sense of hope rather than a blind subservient one. Yes, there is a legend about the great savior who will eventually free the world from darkness, but you'll also notice that there are no followers and there is no religion around this prophecy. When Nico tells people they are the messiah, sure people treat them differently, but no one gets on their knees and beholds them. The prophecy of the messiah is also known to the people of one shot, but they don't actively worship Nico or the player, even though the player is actively referred to as God. The people in this world maintain hope, and remember that they all have a job to do. Whether it's Calamus who has the job of taking care of his sister, Silver's job as the head engineer, or even Nico's job as the messiah. Speaking of Nico, oh man, there is so much that is asked of this kid. Nico is only 8 years old, they miss their mother, and all they want to do is see her again. Even so, after they realize the weight of the player's decision, they go along with their decision regardless. The sacrifice is up to you, the player. You either have to sacrifice the world to save Nico, or sacrifice Nico to save the world. One Shot's story is about life, not having clear-cut answers, but more importantly, no matter how grim a situation, as long as you're still breathing, you can work for a better future. There's a meme between people in the One Shot fan base, where people talk about what Nico is doing right now, as if they're a real person and they're still in their own world. Nico's canonical age was 8 at the time of the game's release, so in 2022, Nico would be around 16 years old right now. I hope Nico grows up to be a really good person. Okay, so we've talked about stories and how important they are, so is it just the stories that make these games compelling? I'm here to argue that the stories are impactful and even the most important part, but there's a little more to it than that. Nico's story is impactful, but how can anyone form a bond with Nico when they look like this? Could Nico have been any set of pixels? Could they have just been a rock? Same with all these characters, they each have only a tiny bit of detail, no pun intended. Who is this? If you played Undertale, you would probably say that this was Asriel Dreamer. Now if I were to show this to someone who has never seen computer graphics before, they would probably say it's just a bunch of colors assorted into a black void. Now I want you to tell me what this is. Now most of you would probably say, yeah, this is just a bunch of colors assorted into a black void. But if you know the story behind it, then you know that this is actually the secret glitched 150 second Pokemon that appeared in the original Pokemon games, also referred to as Missing No. You can probably see where I'm going with this. Yes, the stories aren't make these characters who they are, and though technically they are just colors assorted onto a computer screen, you wouldn't have any form of reference for these sprites if you didn't know the stories behind them. Why is it possible for us to believe and care about this assortment of pixels? What happens in our brain that allows us to do that? My first question would actually be how can our brains even make sense of these pixelated images? How can we go from this sprite to this fan art? Well, as it turns out, neuroscientists have been studying something like this for years now. From all my research, I couldn't find a definitive name for this phenomenon, most likely because we still don't know exactly how it works yet, so no one's been able to take ownership of it. To put it plainly, for the sake of efficiency, the brain works faster than it intends to sometimes. Using information the brain currently has, it can make up an answer to a question by filling in the gaps. You don't see the entire picture, but because your brain is so gosh darn clever, it creates a clear picture in your head to save time. How do we know the brain works this way definitively? Well guess what dear viewer? You are actually doing it right now while watching this video. Every human eyeball actually has a blind spot on it. The spot where your optic nerve connects to your retina has no light sensitive cells so you can't see anything there. Pretty much every human has these spots on their eyes. You've just never noticed it throughout your life because your brain is so good at filling in the gaps. Pretty enlightening, sure, but how does this pertain to pixel art? Well, it's actually the same premise. Just at different levels, isn't it? Remember the picture of the apple? Let's do it again, but this time I'm not going to tell you what it is. See this picture? What is it? Are you sure? It could be a horse. Okay. With 48, it's much clearer now. 
but how can you be sure what it really is? Okay, I'll drop the charade. It's a dog. But tell me how much easier it is to see that it's a dog at 128 rather than 32. Yeah, you probably knew it was a dog from the get-go, but it was easier to tell when you had more bits. A bit is one color or one piece of information. The more bits an image has, the more information is being portrayed in the image and therefore the brain has to work less hard to fill in the gap. Okay, so that's why we can find pixel art just as compelling as regular art, right? Our brains take information within the bits and fill in the information for us so we can clearly make out the character in our head. Yes, but hold on to your seat because I'm here today to also argue that it goes much deeper than that. Let me explain something called an ambiguity illusion. Ambiguity illusion is a freaking mouthful, so let's just call it an ambusion because it sounds funny. Ambusions are pretty much just optical illusions that have more than one interpretation. Check this one for instance. Some people see a duck, others see a rabbit. Both are technically correct. When I look at the image, I can actually swap back and forth between them. Another ambusion came in the form of the whole Yanny Laurel debate from years ago. Laurel. A single sound is played. Some people heard Yanny, other people heard Laurel. What is the point in me telling you all this? This is a picture of Asriel Dreamer, but my Asriel Dreamer will always look different compared to your Asriel Dreamer. Have a listen to this excerpt from a book called The Neuroscience of You by Chantel Pratt, a professor from the University of Washington. One of the major costs of this remarkable flexibility is that humans are born without any significant preconceived notions about how things work. If you've ever had a conversation with someone about an event you both participated in that left you feeling like one of you was delusional because your stories were so different, you might have a hint about how much your experiences have shaped the way you understand the world around you. Your own personal experiences have a profound impact on your memories and even how you perceive the world. Knowing what we know about ambusions, and that we already know that the brain fills in gaps for us, I am willing to argue that because each brain is unique, not only does each brain fill in these sprites differently, but it does this so seamlessly that we've just never noticed the differences before. What? We all see these sprites in different ways? Don't believe me? Then why do you think artists have distinct art styles? It's because their own brains are interpreting or remembering how characters look completely differently. So please try this yourself. Just hear me out, okay? You're gonna flip when you see this. Press Ctrl T on your keyboard twice. If you're on phone, then oh well. In one tab, look up Joel The Last of Us fan art, and then in the other tab, look up Nico One Shot fan art. Are you seeing what I'm seeing? Let's look at Joel. Yes, there are distinct differences within the different pieces of Joel fan art, but overall, they have the same base structure. Head, shoulders, and body all look very similar. Now, look at the Nico fan art. It is so much more varied in terms of style. The different Nico fan arts are so much more varied because the original character is in pixelated form. Our brains have to work incredibly harder when it comes to completing a solid image of Nico in our heads. Joel, on the other hand, had always been portrayed within a high definition format, so human brains as a collective have a much more coherent understanding of what Joel looks like because there isn't much room to get lost in translation from person to person. Maybe next time you talk to your friends about your favorite 2D JRPG style characters, maybe exchange notes and see if you see the character differently than they do. Maybe the differences are subtle, maybe the differences are huge. Okay, so we talked about a lot of stuff today, and I wouldn't blame you if this all seems crazy, but nevertheless, I believe I'm onto something here. We care about these characters, even in their tiny 32-bit forms. The stories that these characters are a part of is what makes us identify with them. But on top of that, it's our own life experiences and how our brains fill in the gaps on our monitors that set these characters aside from any high resolution character. These two big factors are why even today with all of our advancements in computer power, we still see developers choosing these pixelated people. These characters have a specialized trait that stems from the handicap that they have being in the form of bits. Yes, our brain has to work harder to formulate the full picture in our heads, but after they are done, we get something that is tailored to us, a personal view of a character. This can also happen within stories as well. 
Remember when I brought up the controversy of when a portion of Undertale fans demanded the game be played a certain way? That could have just been a case of people perceiving Undertale as something specific, catered to their own life experiences, but when they saw a deviation, they felt personally attacked. I think this realization is truly something to be celebrated, as now you know that whenever you look at a character like Nico, or Asriel, or any of these pixelated characters, you are seeing who they are based on who you are. Every time you look at them, you are getting a personal, biased interpretation of that character that no one else will see the exact same way. They are your own personal interpretation of the character, and that special perception is what makes games like the 2D JRPG strong, even today. Stories in video games will always dictate their impact, no matter what resolution they're in. They should always be prioritized over graphical quality as long as it's playable. Stories from history, stories from legends, or even stories about colors can be captivating. That being said, I'll leave you with this. While making this video, I remember a comment on an Undertale video that I saw a long time ago. Admittedly, when I saw this comment, I thought it was really stupid, but knowing what I know now has given me perspective, if you will. The comment basically talked about how they wanted to tell the story of Azrael to their children in the form of a bedtime story. After everything we talked about, I must say, Wow. With all this technology around us constantly sapping away our attention spans, we can still find the time to pass down stories just like our ancestors did. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.